Actor, Wikipedia article audio. An actor is a person who portrays a character in a performance. The actor performs in the flesh in the traditional medium of the theater or in modern mediums such as film, radio, and television. The analogous Greek term is piomikron kaparoiotatau, literally one who answers. The actor's interpretation of their role pertains to the role played, whether based on a real person or fictional character. Interpretation occurs even when the actor is playing themselves, as in some forms of experimental performance art or, more commonly, to act, is to create, a character in performance. Formerly, in some societies, only men could become actors, and women's roles were generally played by men or boys. When used for the stage, women occasionally played the roles of prepubescent boys. Terminology History After 1660 in England, when women first started to appear on stage, the terms actor or actress were initially used interchangeably for female performers, but later, influenced by the French actress, actress became the commonly used term for women in theater and film. The etymology is a simple derivation from actor with s added. However, when referring to groups of performers of both sexes, actors is preferred. Actor is also used before the full name of a performer as a gender-specific term. Within the profession, the re-adoption of the neutral term dates to the 1950-1960s, the post-war period when the contributions of women to cultural life in general were being reviewed. When The Observer and The Guardian published their new joint style guide in 2010, it stated use for both male and female actors, do not use actress except when in name of award, e.g. Oscar for Best Actress. The authors of the style guide stated that actress comes into the same category as authoress, comedienne, manageress, lady doctor, male nurse and similar obsolete terms that date from a time when professions were largely the preserve of one sex. As Whoopi Goldberg put it in an interview with the paper, an actress can only play a woman. I'm an actor I can play anything. The UK Performers Union Equity has no policy on the use of actor or actress. An equity spokesperson said that the union does not believe that there is a consensus on the matter and stated that the subject divides the profession. In 2009, the Los Angeles Times stated that actress remains the common term used in major acting awards given to female recipients. With regard to the cinema of the United States, the gender-neutral term player was common in film in the silent film era and the early days of the motion picture production code, but in the 2000s in a film context, it is generally deemed archaic. However, player remains in use in the theater, often incorporated into the name of a theater group or company, such as the American Players, the East-West Players, etc. Also, actors in improvisational theater may be referred to as players. The first recorded case of a performing actor occurred in 534 BC when the Greek performer Thespis stepped onto the stage at the theater Dionysus to become the first known person to speak words as a character in a play or story. Prior to Thespis' act, Grecian stories were only expressed in song, dance, and in third-person narrative. In honor of Thespis, actors are commonly called thespians. The exclusively male actors in the theatre of ancient Greece performed in three types of drama, tragedy, comedy, and the satyr play. Western theatre developed and expanded considerably under the Romans. The theatre of ancient Rome was a thriving and diverse art form, ranging from festival performances of street theatre, nude dancing, and acrobatics, 
to the staging of situation comedies, to high style, verbally elaborate tragedies. As the Western Roman Empire fell into decay through the 4th and 5th centuries, the seat of Roman power shifted to Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire. Records show that mime, pantomime, scenes, or recitations from tragedies and comedies, dances, and other entertainments were very popular. From the 5th century, Western Europe was plunged into a period of general disorder. Small nomadic bands of actors traveled around Europe throughout the period, performing wherever they could find an audience, there is no evidence that they produced anything but crude scenes. Traditionally, actors were not of high status, therefore, in the early Middle Ages, traveling acting troops were often viewed with distrust. Early Middle Ages actors were denounced by the Church during the Dark Ages, as they were viewed as dangerous, immoral, and pagan. In many parts of Europe, traditional beliefs of the region and time period meant actors could not receive a Christian burial. In the early Middle Ages, churches in Europe began staging dramatized versions of biblical events. By the middle of the 11th century, liturgical drama had spread from Russia to Scandinavia to Italy. The Feast of Fools encouraged the development of comedy. In the late Middle Ages, plays were produced in 127 towns. These vernacular mystery plays often contained comedy, with actors playing devils, villains, and clowns. The majority of actors in these plays were drawn from the local population. Amateur performers in England were exclusively male but other countries had female performers. 19th century There were a number of secular plays staged in the Middle Ages, the earliest of which is the play of the Greenwood by Adam de la Halle in 1276. It contains satirical scenes and folk material such as fairies and other supernatural occurrences. Farces also rose dramatically in popularity after the 13th century. At the end of the late Middle Ages, professional actors began to appear in England and Europe. Richard III and Henry VII both maintained small companies of professional actors. Beginning in the mid-16th century, Commedia dell'arte troops performed lively improvisational playlets across Europe for centuries. Commedia dell'arte was an actor-centered theater, requiring little scenery and very few props. Plays were loose frameworks that provided situations, complications, and outcome of the action, around which the actors improvised. The plays utilized stock characters. A troupe typically consisted of 13 to 14 members. Most actors were paid a share of the play's profits roughly equivalent to the sizes of their roles. Renaissance theatre derived from several medieval theatre traditions, such as the mystery plays, morality plays, and the university drama that attempted to recreate Athenian tragedy. The Italian tradition of Commedia dell'arte, as well as the elaborate masks frequently presented at court, also contributed to the shaping of public theatre. Since before the reign of Elizabeth I, companies of players were attached to households of leading aristocrats and performed seasonally in various locations. These became the foundation for the professional players that performed on the Elizabethan stage. 20th Century the development of the theatre and opportunities for acting ceased when Puritan opposition to the stage banned the performance of all plays within London. Puritans viewed the theatre as immoral. The reopening of the theatres in 1660 signalled a renaissance of English drama. English comedies written and performed in the Restoration period from 1660 to 1710 are collectively called Restoration Comedy. 
Restoration comedy is notorious for its sexual explicitness. At this point, women were allowed for the first time to appear on the English stage, exclusively in female roles. This period saw the introduction of the first professional actresses and the rise of the first celebrity actors. In the 19th century, the negative reputation of actors was largely reversed, and acting became an honored, popular profession and art. The rise of the actor as celebrity provided the transition, as audiences flocked to their favorite stars. A new role emerged for the actor managers, who formed their own companies and controlled the actors, the productions, and the financing. When successful, they built up a permanent clientele that flocked to their productions. They could enlarge their audience by going on tour across the country, performing a repertoire of well-known plays, such as those by Shakespeare. The newspapers, private clubs, pubs, and coffee shops rang with lively debates evaluating the relative merits of the stars and the productions. Henry Irving was the most successful of the British actor-managers. Irving was renowned for his Shakespearean roles, and for such innovations as turning out the house lights so that attention could focus more on the stage and less on the audience. His company toured across Britain, as well as Europe and the United States, demonstrating the power of star actors and celebrated roles to attract enthusiastic audiences. His knighthood in 1895 indicated full acceptance into the higher circles of British society. By the early 20th century, the economics of large-scale productions displaced the actor-manager model. It was too hard to find people who combined a genius at acting as well as management, so specialization divided the roles as stage managers and later theatre directors emerged. Financially, much larger capital was required to operate out of a major city. The solution was corporate ownership of chains of theatres, such as by the theatrical syndicate, Edward Lorillard, and especially the Schubert organization. By catering to tourists, theatres in large cities increasingly favoured long runs of highly popular plays, especially musicals. Big-name stars became even more essential. Techniques Formerly, in some societies, only men could become actors. In ancient Greece and ancient Rome and the medieval world, it was considered disgraceful for a woman to go on stage, this belief persisted until the 17th century in Venice. In the time of William Shakespeare, women's roles were generally played by men or boys. As Opposite Sex when an 18-year Puritan prohibition of drama was lifted after the English Restoration of 1660, women began to appear on stage in England. Margaret Hughes is oft credited as the first professional actress on the English stage. This prohibition ended during the reign of Charles II in part because he enjoyed watching actresses on stage. The first occurrence of the term actress was in 1608 according to the OED and is ascribed to Middleton. In the 19th century many viewed women in acting negatively, as actresses were often courtesans and associated with promiscuity. Despite these prejudices, the 19th century also saw the first female acting stars, most notably Sarah Bernhardt types. In Japan, onagata, men taking on female roles, were used in kabuki theater when women were banned from performing on stage during the Edo period. This convention continues. By contrast, some forms of Chinese drama involve women playing all roles. In modern times, women occasionally played the roles of prepubescent boys. For example, the stage role of Peter Pan is traditionally played by a woman, 
as are most principal boys in British pantomime. Opera has several britches roles traditionally sung by women, usually mezzo-sopranos. Examples are Hansel and Hansel und Gretel, Cherubino in The Marriage of Figaro and Octavian in Der Rosenkavalier. In theatre Women playing male roles are uncommon in film, with notable exceptions. In 1982, Stina Ekblad played the mysterious Ismail Ritsinski in Fanny and Alexander, and Linda Hunt received the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress for playing Billy Kwan in The Year of Living Dangerously. In 2007, Kate Blanchett was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress for playing Jude Quinn, a fictionalized representation of Bob Dylan in the 1960s, in I'm Not There. In the 20 hundreds, women playing men in live theatre is particularly common in presentations of older plays, such as Shakespearean works with large numbers of male characters in roles where gender is inconsequential. Having an actor dress as the opposite sex for comic effect is also a long-standing tradition in comic theater and film. Most of Shakespeare's comedies include instances of overt cross-dressing, such as Francis Flute in A Midsummer Night's Dream. The movie A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum stars Jack Guilford dressing as a young bride. Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon famously posed as women to escape gangsters in the Billy Wilder film Some Like It Hot. Cross-dressing for comic effect was a frequently used device in most of the carry-on films. Dustin Hoffman and Robin Williams have each appeared in a hit comedy film in which they played most scenes dressed as a woman. Occasionally, the issue is further complicated, for example, by a woman playing a woman acting as a man who then pretends to be a woman, such as Julie Andrews in Victor slash Victoria, or Gwyneth Paltrow in Shakespeare in Love. In its pat, the movie, film watchers never learn the gender of the androgynous main characters Pat and Chris. Similarly, in the aforementioned example of The Marriage of Figaro, there is a scene in which Cherubino dresses up and acts as a woman, the other characters in the scene are aware of a single level of gender role obfuscation, while the audience is aware of two levels. A few modern roles are played by a member of the opposite sex in order to emphasize the gender fluidity of the role. Edna Turnblad in Hairspray was played by Divine in the 1988 original film. Harvey Fierstein in the Broadway musical, and John Travolta in the 2007 movie musical. Felicity Huffman was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actress for playing Brie Osborne in 2005's Transamerica. In film Actors working in theater, film, television, and radio have to learn specific skills. Techniques that work well in one type of acting may not work well in another type of acting. Silent Films To act on stage, actors need to learn the stage directions that appear in the script, such as stage left and stage right. These directions are based on the actor's point of view as he or she stands on the stage facing the audience. Actors also have to learn the meaning of the stage directions upstage and downstage theater actors need to learn blocking, which is, where and how an actor moves on the stage during a play. Most scripts specify some blocking. The director also gives instructions on blocking, such as crossing the stage or picking up and using a prop. Some theater actors need to learn stage combat which is simulated fighting on stage. Actors may have to simulate hand-to-hand -hand or sword. Actors are coached by fight directors, who help them learn the choreographed sequence of fight actions. From 1894 to the late 1920s, movies were silent films. 
silent film actors emphasized body language and facial expression, so that the audience could better understand what an actor was feeling and portraying on screen. Much silent film acting is apt to strike modern-day audiences as simplistic or campy. The melodramatic acting style was in some cases a habit actors transferred from their former stage experience. Vaudeville theatre was an especially popular origin for many American silent film actors. The pervading presence of stage actors in film was the cause of this outburst from director Marshall Nealon in 1917, the sooner the stage people who have come into pictures get out, the better for the pictures. In other cases, directors such as John Griffith Ray required their actors to deliver larger-than-life expressions for emphasis. As early as 1914, American viewers had begun to make known their preference for greater naturalness on screen. Pioneering film directors in Europe and the United States recognized the different limitations and freedoms of the mediums of stage and screen by the early 1910s. Silent films became less vaudevillian in the mid-1910s, as the differences between stage and screen became apparent. Due to the work of directors such as D.W. Griffith, cinematography became less stage-like, and the then-revolutionary close-up shot allowed subtle and naturalistic acting. In America, D.W. Griffith's company Biograph Studios, became known for its innovative direction and acting, conducted suit the cinema rather than the stage. Griffith realized that theatrical acting did not look good on film and required his actors and actresses to go through weeks of film acting training. Advent of Sound in Film Role of Women In Television In Radio Lillian Gish has been called film's first true actress for her work in the period, as she pioneered new film performing techniques, recognizing the crucial differences between stage and screen acting. Directors such as Albert K. Blani and Maurice Turner began to insist on naturalism in their films. By the mid-1920s many American silent films had adopted a more naturalistic acting style, though not all actors and directors accepted naturalistic low-key acting straight away, as late as 1927, films featuring expressionistic acting styles, such as Metropolis, were still being released. According to Anton Kays, a silent film scholar from the University of Wisconsin, American silent cinema began to see a shift in acting techniques between 1913 and 1921 influenced by techniques found in German silent film. This is mainly attributed to the influx of emigrants from the Weimar Republic, including film directors, producers, cameramen, lighting, and stage technicians, as well as actors and actresses. Film actors have to learn to get used to and be comfortable with a camera being in front of them. Film actors need to learn to find and stay on their mark. This is a position on the floor marked with tape. This position is where the lights and camera focus are optimized. Film actors also need to learn how to prepare well and perform well on screen tests. Screen tests are a filmed audition of part of the script. Unlike theater actors, who develop characters for repeat performances, film actors lack continuity, forcing them to come to all scenes with a fully developed character already. Since film captures even the smallest gesture and magnifies it, cinema demands a less flamboyant and stylized bodily performance from the actor than does the theater. The performance of emotion is the most difficult aspect of film acting to master, the film actor must rely on subtle facial tics, quivers, and tiny lifts of the eyebrow to create a believable character. Some theater stars, 
have made the theatre to cinema transition quite successfully, others have not. In 2015, Forbes reported that, just 21 of the 100 top grossing films of 2014 featured a female lead or CO lead, while only 28.1% of characters in 100 top grossing films were female. In the US, there is an industry wide in salaries of all scales. On average, white women get paid 78 cents to every dollar a white man makes while Hispanic women earn 56 cents to a white male's dollar, black women 64 cents and Native American women just 59 cents to that. Forbes' analysis of U.S. acting salaries in 2013 determined that the men on Forbes' list of top paid actors for that year made two one-half times as much money as the top paid actresses. That means that Hollywood's best compensated actresses made just 40 cents for every dollar that the best compensated men made. On a television set, there are typically several cameras angled at the set. Actors who are new to on-screen acting can get confused about which camera to look into. TV actors need to learn to use lav mics. TV actors need to understand the concept of frame. The term frame refers to the area that the camera's lens is capturing. Within the acting industry, there are four types of television roles one could land on a show. Each type varies in prominence, frequency of appearance, and pay. The first is known as a series regular the main actors on the show as part of the permanent cast. Actors in recurring roles are under contract to appear in multiple episodes of a series. A CO star role is a small speaking role that usually only appears in one episode. A guest star is a larger role than a CO star role, and the character is often the central focus of the episode or integral to the plot. Actor Game Radio drama is a dramatized, purely acoustic performance, broadcast on radio or published on audio media, such as tape or CD. With no visual component, radio drama depends on dialogue, music, and sound effects to help the listener imagine the characters and story, it is auditory in the physical dimension but equally powerful as a visual force in the psychological dimension. Radio drama achieved widespread popularity within a decade of its initial development in the 1920s. By the 1940s, it was a leading international popular entertainment. With the advent of television in the 1950s, however, radio drama lost some of its popularity, and in some countries has never regained large audiences. However, Recordings of Otter survive today in the audio archives of collectors and museums, as well as several online sites such as Internet Archive. As of 2011, radio drama has a minimal presence on terrestrial radio in the United States. Much of American radio drama is restricted to rebroadcasts or podcasts of programs from previous decades. However, other nations still have thriving traditions of radio drama. In the United Kingdom, for example, the BBC produces and broadcasts hundreds of new radio plays each year on Radio 3, Radio 4, and Radio 4 Extra. Podcasting has also offered the means of creating new radio dramas, in addition to the distribution of vintage programs. Sources the terms audio drama or audio theater are sometimes used synonymously with radio drama with one possible distinction, audio drama or audio theater may not necessarily be intended specifically for broadcast on radio. Audio drama, whether newly produced or auteur classics, can be found on CDs, cassette tapes, podcasts, webcasts and conventional broadcast radio. 
thanks to advances in digital recording and internet distribution, radio drama is experiencing a revival.